Okay, today we're going to be talking about section 12.1, identifying the substance of genes. So what is the role of DNA in our heredity? Um, DNA makes up our genes, and it must be able to store information both and then copy it and also transmit the information to the other parts of the cell. So it has to have a lot of jobs. The most important job of DNA is to store information. That's the most important job. Um, it stores it in genes, and genes control a pattern of development. That's the instructions that cause a single cell to develop into any kind of organism, an oak tree, a sea urchin, or a dog. And these instructions must be written into the DNA of the organism. We talked in chapter 10 about cell division. And before a cell divides, the cell must be able to make a copy of every one of its genes. And it makes that copy during the S phase of the uh, interphase so and the cell cycle. So we have to copy every one of its genes, every single one. <clears throat> and it's like an encyclopedia or a large dictionary, and every single way, single word must be copied. And we have to get an exact copy of that DNA. Uh, it was puzzling to many scientists how the DNA could be copied. But once they discovered the structure of the DNA, the copying, uh, the way it copied was understood very quickly. When a cell divides, each of our daughter cells must have an exact, complete copy of the genetic information of the DNA. Um, we have to carefully sort the DNA during meiosis, which is the development of uh, the gametes which we'll talk about in, uh, we talked about in meiosis. Um, the loss of the DNA during meiosis could mean loss of valuable genetic information. Maybe we lose some important cells, lose important parts, or important proteins. DNA, if you recall, is a uh, nucleic acid and it's made up of a long chain of nucleotides that are held together by covalent bonds. Those long strands of nucleotides. Very long. The nucle nucleic acids in our cell nuclei were known for a long time, that they were long, slightly acidic molecules, but the structure was not understood. Today we understand that nucleic acids are made up of these nucleotides linked together to form long chains. The nucleotides are made up of three components. They're made up of a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose, and that's this part here in the middle. They're made up of a phosphate group which is this part on the end, and then they're made up of a nitrogenous base, and the bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. There's only four different bases. The nucleotides in DNA are held together strongly by covalent bonds formed between their sugar and phosphate groups. Remember, a covalent bond is one where we have sharing of electrons. The four kinds of nitrogen base, nitrogenous bases are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, and they kind of stick out sideways from the nucleotide chain. So they kind of stick out from the chain. These four nucleotides could be joined in together in any order. We could have adenine and then another adenine, and then another, then a cytosine, or we could have thymine, and then a guanine, and then another adenine. So any sequence of bases is possible. 
What kind of clues help scientists solve uh, the structure of DNA? There were clues in a female scientist named Rosalind Franklin. She took an x-ray picture of the DNA and that enabled two scientists, Watson and Crick, to come up with a model that explained the structure and properties of DNA. Watson and Crick win the Nobel Prize for discovering the structure of the DNA and Rosalind Franklin did not. Another scientist, Erwin Shargaff, discovered that the amount of adenine and thymine in any sample was equal. And he also discovered that the amount of guanine and cytosine was also equal. So this idea that adenine is the same amount as thymine and guanine is the same amount as cytosine, that we call that Shargaff's rules. DNA is actually a called a double helix, and that helps to explain Shargaff's rule of base pairing that adenine, that the adenine is always with thymine and the guanine is always with cytosine. And it also helps us to see how two, the two strands of DNA are held together. There are actually two strands of DNA. The two strands of DNA come together and then twist together like a twisted ladder, and we call that a double helix. In this picture here, we can see the double helix. This is the side of the ladder, that's the adenine, the, sorry, that's the sugar and phosphate groups. And then we can see the, uh, this part is the bases, the adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. And then it twists together to make a, it twists to make a, what we call the double helix, like a spiral staircase. In the double helix, the two strands of DNA are what we call anti-parallel. That means they run in opposite directions. So the picture here, we go, it says three prime to five prime, and then three prime to five prime in the opposite direction. That's just showing us the arrangement of the sugar, um, of the sugar a phosphate bond and the other way it was phosphate sugar phosphate sugar and then what this does it allows the bases on either side that come in to the from the middle the bases come in um, stick in from the middle here's one base here's another base here's another base from one strand and then the bases from the other strand stick out in the middle as well. And then we're looking for a, then we have some hydrogen bonding that holds the two halves of the strands together. This allow, this double stranded idea allows the uh, helix to carry a sequence of nucleotides. Remember there's only four nucleotides and it's like we're arranging them in words but we only have a four letter alphabet. So Watson and Crick discovered that there were hydrogen bonds between the nitrogen bases and that provided them enough force to hold the two strands of the DNA together. So he's looking at, so here's guanine and it has one, two, three hydrogen bonds that connect it to cytosine. But thymine here only has two hydrogen bonds that connect it to adenine. And these hydrogen bonds are weak forces that allow the two strands to be held together, but also allows them to separate when needed. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. These hydrogen bonds in between the guanine and cytosine 
or the adenine and thymine would show that to act, they act almost like puzzle pieces. So the guanine has three hydrogen bonds that only fits next to cytosine, and the adenine with its two hydrogen bonds can only fit next to thymine. So the three and the two hydrogen bonds allow them to come up with what we call the uh, ATCG base pairing rule and that we see here. This hydrogen bonding, that base pairing, explains Chargaff's rule and explains why we always have the same amount of adenine as we do thymine because they pair up. Same for guanine and cytosine, they pair up. So for every adenine on one side, there has to be, for every adenine on one side, there has to be a thymine directly across from it. And for every cytosine, there has to be a guanine directly across from it.